Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first of our really live meetings, and it's going to be very lively. Uh, it's great to see everybody. Um, uh, before we start the proceedings, I'll just do the usual domestic things. The toilets are downstairs. You access them from, you need to go out that way to the back. Uh, the fire exits, there's a fire exit from the front door and at the side, and there's also one here. And for the people at the back, you go down the stairs, the stone stairs, and you can get out uh, at the fire escape there. But hopefully we won't uh, need to use the fire escape. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to uh, somebody else who's going to chair this evening's meeting, but uh, I'm delighted to say that we have William Dalrymple here, and this is our Minerva lecture. So at the end of the lecture, I'll present him with the Minerva medal. But I'm really pleased to be able to hand over to a colleague from the history department in Glasgow, who also has a background in the subject that we're going to be hearing about this evening. So I'll hand over to Andrew McKillop, who will chair uh, the meeting this evening. I have this overarching urge to use the gavel, but unfortunately, <laughs> I don't actually have much uh, use for that. Um, first of all, let me um, thank uh, the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow for giving me the honour of chairing um, um, tonight's proceedings. It's a great honour and privilege uh, as, um, um, as someone who works, um, albeit far less dramatically or effectively in the field that William will be talking about. It's a great pleasure for me, privilege uh, a great pri personal privilege for me to chair tonight's meeting. Um, but before I start, can I just also reiterate a couple of housekeeping rules? Um, first of all, could I ask you all to turn your mobiles off, which I forgot to do until a second ago, uh, and uh, put your pagers on silent, unless, of course, um, you are required to be on call, in which case we will forgive you. Um, also, uh, um, Pat pointed out where the um, where toilets are, but could I also just point out where the um, exits are. Um, probably for those of you two thirds of the way you would go out these two uh, uh, exits, but there's also like aircraft, one behind you and on the right, you can use that should we have to leave the exit. If we do, uh, the um, gathering point is on the Otago Street uh, of um, uh, the Otago Street side of Gibson Street. Um, I've now been asked uh, to try and introduce the speaker and to keep it to less than five minutes so that we can get as much time out of William as possible. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually looked at William Dalrymple's CV, but trying to introduce him in less than five minutes is a bit of a gargantuan task. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the subject of the lecture because that will be his uh, privilege. What I will point out, I think, are some of the personal dimensions of uh, William Dalrymple that I think we all want to bear in mind when listening to him. Um, he hails from East Lothian, the other side of the country. We are not to hold that against him. Um, but in many ways, uh, William is a true uh, citizen of the world, um, both in his uh, lived experience and in his um, vast um, scholarly, literary, and cultural outputs. To describe him as a polymath um, um, a concept which was actually very important to this society as it was formed and as it developed um, is to uh, underestimate it. He's a writer, columnist, cultural uh, commentator, um, both um, of the past and of pertinent and pressing political issues. Uh, he has produced some amazing um, cultural and artistic exhibitions. Uh, he is a man of many talents. Um, he's moved into the world of blogging uh, uh, um, with um, uh, a fellow uh, interested uh, party in South Asian history and culture, and it's bringing in unheard of numbers. Um, so you look the medium, uh, you'll find William there. Um, I think it's interesting to point out that uh, much of his early writing was interestingly travelogue. It was on uh, 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 um, looking at how you can, I suppose, explore different societies by traveling through it. He has an obvious love of geography, of spirituality and the relationship between them. Um, he uh, um, doesn't just write about history, 
He writes about economics, about language, about, in a sense, the whole holistic panoply of it all. Um, I strongly recommend that you find much of that literary uh, 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 brilliance in one of the best books I've ever read, because I always love Byzantium. But read his Holy Mountain, A Journey in the Shadow of Byzantium. It is truly a brilliant read amongst many. Um, he is also a, a major, major um, world literary figure. Um, anyone with the slightest uh, conception of uh, 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 um, the literary scene will know that along with um, uh, Namista Golak, he is the co-founder of the world's largest free literary uh, 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 festival, the Jaipur Literary Festival, founded in 2006. It is difficult to underestimate how large and globally influential that event is. He is the co-founder and I think probably still co-director. Um, however, mercifully, he has an abiding interest in history uh, uh, and um, even in his travelogue and in much of his other literature, history was always infused and suffused through it. He is a wonderful writer of history. Um, whenever I feel depressed and have imposter syndrome, I have to go and read William uh, to make sure that it's reinforced. Uh, my ability to write history pales into insignificance against a true wordsmith. Actually, however brilliant is and accessible his writing is, it's worth stressing how cutting edge his history is. Um, he often doesn't just reflect cutting edge historical practice, he often takes a particular lead in it. And I'm thinking here particularly the role of family life um, and family dynamics inside the colonial assault in India by the British. That was leading in its time and remains cutting edge. All these influences can be seen in his seminal and uh, um, world influential uh, set of studies, the Company Quartet, four books on Britain's massive and sustained assault on South Asia, an assault which, remember, will bring one in five, or close to one in five people on earth under first a corporate and then ultimately sovereign rule. It remains and may remain um, the largest act of territorial and colonial conquest by a Western imperial power, um, unless Putin presumably uh, tries to match it. And let's be quite honest, he isn't doing very well. Um, in other words, it is history of epochal and world changing uh, uh, framing we're dealing with here. And it is on the last of those four books that William will talk tonight, The Anarchy, uh, The Relentless Rise of the East India Company, published in 2019 and the subject of tonight's first lecture. William, over to you. Am I allowed to do the gavel? I've never done this before. <laughs> I had to do that, forgive me. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much um, for that introduction. Andrew is too modest to say it, but he's an astonishing scholar of the East India Company. I've learned a huge amount from him and we'll be quoting him in this lecture. Um, he has particularly um, put facts and figures and done extraordinary research onto the Scottish part of the East India Company story. Um, we often in this country like to think of ourselves as the victims uh, of colonialism and imperialism and aggression, uh, but the Scots were leading the assault on India and proportionately far more Scots played a role per head and population than the English did. Uh, and um, Andrew's work has shown how the profits of that have uh, trickled into every town in Scotland, many of the public buildings surrounding us here in Glasgow, but also across Scotland, are built on money made in India, often um, of fairly dubious origins. Uh, and um, it's very important that we realize how much our prosperity came at the cost uh, of those we colonized. Uh, and it's something that I think very few of us realize because it plays very little part in our history lessons at school. Uh, and uh, very few people uh, in this room will have actually come across anything I think that I will be saying tonight in their history curriculum. Um, the older members of the audience may remember sort of studying the Battle of Plassey as a sort of heroic event that um, Clive of India did on his civilizing mission in India, but the um, the true costs of that 
uh, are um, one of the things I want to bring out tonight. And we will start with Clive, because um, this is the house which uh, his family uh, ended up uh, marrying into and, uh, and controlling it. It looks a long way from India, and it may seem an odd place to start a lecture uh, about India, um, because nothing more sort of British or English could be imagined, although it's actually on the borders of Wales. Um, these lovely Elizabethan box hedges and Tudor windows and this sort of Renaissance portico in front. But go inside the long gallery at Powys, and you'll see a very different picture. Room after room of Indian loot. Loot, incidentally, being a Hindi word uh, that was introduced into the English language at this period to describe exactly the sort of objects uh, we're looking at in this picture. Indian swords, shields, spears, uh, a wonderful uh, Indian jama and, and gorgeous uh, uh, mogul uh, cloth uh, on the left, uh, tiger's heads from Tipu's throne, major objects of Indian history. Uh, this is Siraj Dowler's palanquin abandoned on the battlefield of Plassey, sitting that we're looking through here. And if you go through the arch at the end of this picture, you arrive in Tipu Sultan's battle tent. Now, what is this loot doing in a private house in the Welsh countryside? Because there is more loot in these galleries than you will find in the National Museum in Delhi, in the National Museum in, in uh, Karachi, uh, in the National Museum in Afghanistan, or the National Museum in Bangladesh. Uh, in fact, there's more than all of them put together sitting here in a private house in the Welsh countryside. But uh, while this is a particularly rich example of, of Indian loot, you will find bits of Indian loot in most of the big sort of national trust houses where you can go and have a nice cup of tea in uh, somewhere in the highlands, but you'll find the money often either comes, uh, if it's an 18th century house, either from the loot of India or the slave trade. And the story, the particular story of Powys is told in a picture you actually pass under to enter these, this kazana, this treasury. Uh, it's not a very good picture. Benjamin West is not a great painter. Uh, but it's a very important scene that it illustrates, and one that had terrible consequences for India and which enormously enhanced the uh, financial security of all of us in Britain. Because what you have in this picture, utterly unhistorical, which bears absolutely no resemblance to the actual events that it uh, represents, uh, it, it, the, the, the lack of realism is partly conveyed in the caption, Sha'alam conveying the gift of the Diwani to Lord Clive. Now, uh, even in India, not many people will know what that means. A gift, it sounds like, you know, is it Christmas? Is it a Diwali present? What wonderful present is being given here? Um, well, in the center of the picture, you have a Mughal emperor, Sha'alam, and he's handing a document to a slightly portly uh, overweight Englishman, who is Lord Clive. Behind him is Archibald Swinton, who is incidentally the direct ancestor of the actress Tilda Swinton, uh, another Scottish borders dynasty, which, uh, which did very well at this time uh, out of looting India. Uh, and what that document is doing uh, is after the victory of the East India Company over the Mughal Emperor, uh, the Nawab of Bengal, and the Nawab uh, of Avad, uh, Shuja Udawla, at the Battle of Buxar in 1765. Um, the East India Company, which is a corporation, it's not the British government, this didn't happen out of Downing Street, didn't happen with the, uh, with the British Army, it happened with the East India Company, a corporation, a business, a for-profit business. Uh, and this corporation, basically, at the point of a ban, it forced the Mughal Emperor to hand over the financial administrations of the three richest provinces in India, Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, uh, to this company. And, and I say it is literally a company. This is the headquarters. Uh, it's sitting, uh, this is where the Lloyds building in, in the city of London is today. Uh, but here you are in the 18th century, it could be Charlotte Square or uh, Buchanan Street. Look at lovely Georgia building, five windows wide. Uh, it's not even the two buildings on either side. 
it's just the small building in the middle, uh, about the size of this church. Um, and like the ladies and gentlemen in the picture here, you could walk past it, past the railings without even noticing that it was there. But from this building was organized the conquest of what was then the richest country in the world. India in the 18th century controlled about 30% of the world's gross domestic product. These are very rough figures and, and there can be much disputed, but that's the rough order of things. And at around the time that the East India Company was formed in London, Britain was uh, uh, generating about 1.7% of the world's gross domestic product. And yet by a strange quirk of history, and I'm gonna talk about how this happened in a minute, a company, one company based in one building that for its first century had less than 35 employees in that building, conquered the richest country in the world. And over about 50 years between the 1750s and around 1803, uh, the East India Company piecemeal, step by step, conquered, looted, and asset stripped this, uh, this extraordinary country. Uh, and that sent a great deal of the wealth here, which is why Britain, which was a middle ranking um, European nation way behind in the 16th century, in the 17th century, um, way behind Portugal and Spain, which were rich with money coming from um, the New World, the, the gold of the Incas and the Aztecs and all that sort of thing, uh, behind uh, in, in per capita wealth, Italy and France. Why? Uh, both England and Scotland rose up the ranks until by the mid 18th century, uh, you have enough money to, which is really the seed funding for the uh, industrial revolution, which then puts the whole thing into, a, uh, a, into an even greater um, uh, uh, velocity of, of, of growth and, and, and wealth. Um, how on earth did they do it? It was an extraordinary process. Uh, they pulled off a ridiculous trick that is almost incomprehensible to us today. They employed Indian soldiers, mercenaries, to conquer other Indians. And they did so at least partly with money borrowed from Indian bankers. Why on earth would Indian bankers lend to, uh, and that's the other sort of thing, 250 white guys in, it, uh, in India did this. Uh, why would they lend to these to these people? Because the East India Company, while it looted, raped, asset stripped, and did everything else, repaid its debts on time with interest, and it understood the importance of honoring financial contracts. So two groups, very different, red-coated, beef-eating Englishmen and Scots, uh, managed to do a deal with homespun wearing vegetarian Jain and Hindu bankers. And the bankers lend the money to the company who use it to pay top dollar to Indian sepoys, about twice as much you could get being a trooper of the East India Company than being your, the equivalent in the army of Tipu Sultan. And in 50 years, these armies of sepoys conquer India city by city, province by province, war by war. These wars begin partly accidentally, partly defensively, but by the climax under Lord Wellesley, whose brother sits with the traffic cone on his head uh, in, <laughs> in Buchanan Street, the Duke of Wellington. Um, the, uh, these are planned wars of conquest and annexation uh, with a very deliberate policy of seizing them for this country and ultimately once the country has been, once this company has been nationalized and it becomes increasingly uh, 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 from the 1780s, the, the government gets a financial interest in it. And from the 1780s onwards, it becomes more and more a public private partnership. So that by uh, the uh, 1800s, it's really an organ of state. But it begins very modestly with this man. Uh, and the year is 1599, the same year that Shakespeare is writing both Julius Caesar and Hamlet. And if you had been Shakespeare and you decided to leave the Globe Theatre in 1599 and put down your draft of Hamlet or uh, wherever he got to at this point, 
uh, in September 1599, you could have walked along the Thames, crossed Old London Bridge, and um, found your way to Moorgate Fields, not as it is today a grotty tube station, uh, but as its name suggests, fields on the edge of London. And in the middle of these fields was something called the Founders Hall. Founders as in metal founders, wow. brass founders, rather than the founder of something. Uh, but in this black and white Tudor building, a meeting was called by this man, Sir Thomas Smythe, in September 1599. Customer Smythe, as he was known, was in charge of the customs. He made a fortune on the customs. And when he hears that the Dutch have successfully um, broken the old spice trade and sailed around the Cape of Good Hope and brought spices back, not from India, but from what we today would call Indonesia, uh, the East Indies and Tudor parlance. Uh, he decides when the Dutch arrive in London trying to buy up British uh, English ships, uh, he says, we're not going to sell them. Uh, and in a, in a sort of swaggery, Brexity sort of tone, uh, he says, we're going to do our own thing. And he calls a meeting in the Founders Hall in September 1599, on the 22nd of September. And here, bizarrely surviving in the British Library, is the list of subscribers. And you can read it on the top. Number one, Mayor of London, £200. Number two, uh, George uh, Bontis, £1,000, and so on. It goes on. So all these people are basically subscribing to what we would call a startup. Uh, and it goes on. And by the 20th page, it's people who are describing themselves not as Lord Mayor of London, but as vintners, as leather workers, as skinners, ordinary people putting in a tiny bit of money. And what they're doing is they are participating in a new Elizabethan idea, which is a joint stock company. Obvious idea for us, but it's an invention. In the Middle Ages, you had guilds, so if all the wool workers of Suffolk could club together and go off to Brussels and, and, and negotiate prices for their wool. Uh, but you had to be a wool worker to be part of it. What was innovative about these Tudor corporations, the first one being the Muscovy Company, founded in the 1580s, 1550s, was that anyone could invest. Uh, you didn't have to be a wool worker, you didn't have to be whatever it was, you could just put your savings in and get a share of the profits. And this is the beginning of the corporation as we know it today. The same thing that exists with Microsoft or Google or ExxonMobil or any of the massive multinational corporations. This is where it begins. And this is why the study of it is so interesting because what you're seeing when you study the East India Company is the birth of the modern multinational. And many of the things we fear most about these big corporations, which now control our lives and which have turnovers larger than most uh, uh, nation states, uh, most of the, these frightening aspects of corporations, the ability to topple governments, the enormous sums of money they can use for lobbying governments and bribing politicians, and the strange alchemy by which suddenly the uh, the uh, needs of a company or the uh, the aspirations of a company become the aspirations of foreign policy for a government. These sinews of commerce are what uh, and finance are what power the East India Company. And the East India Company invents a lot of it. The very first case of known corporate corruption happens uh, only 60 years after this, in, 15, in, in 1660, when the governor of the, the then governor of the East India Company ends up in the Tower of London, when he's caught handing out cash to MPs to extend the monopoly of the company. Uh, a, a very familiar situation, <laughs> not just uh, with our crooked government here, but uh, in other democracies. How do any democratic parties anywhere in the world finance themselves largely through corporate donations? What's the pro quid quo? We never quite know. This begins here. So they raise some money and they need a captain. So they go to this character, Sir James Lancaster. Not an obvious choice, you might say, because he just sunk the ship in the top left-hand corner of this portrait when he was appointed for the voyage. But he was the only captain who'd ever been to the East Indies in Britain. And he was a, uh, a Tudor uh, English captain who had sunk his ship uh, on the way back. All his crew were eaten by cannibals, but he'd managed to escape and get home. Uh, and they appoint him and he goes off to Deptford and looks for a ship. 
He rejects a creaky old hulk called the Mayflower, which he regards as unseaworthy, uh, and instead chooses a, a ship, and I'm not making this up, called the, it's a pirate ship, uh, called the Scourge of Malice. Um, this is not Johnny Depp's flagship from Pirates of the Caribbean, but an actual historical vessel. Uh, but already showing a, a talent for PR that many subsequent corporations will, will adopt, uh, they rename the Scourge of Malice uh, the uh, Red Dragon, as if it's a nice country pub in the Welsh countryside. And off they sail. And there's a slight embarrassment because they are becalmed off the coast of Dover and people come and wave at them and have picnics and, uh, and, and laugh at these guys who thought they're going off to the way, way East Indies but uh, can't get beer even as far as Calais. Uh, but anyway, the wind does pick up and they off they go and to their own surprise, they sail around the Cape of Good Hope. And just as they're approaching the East Indies, the modern Jakarta, Batavia, um, and they don't even have to land, they find a Portuguese ship coming in the opposite direction. Uh, and as they are a bunch of pirates or in the plight Elizabethan euphemism privateers, uh, uh, they just jump on the Portuguese ship, transfer its contents to their own sail home and sell it for a million pounds in London. Uh, and that buys them this, which is the first of their properties uh, in, uh, uh, in Leadenhall Street, which looks rather like a nice sort of Tudor pub in, in, in sort of Shropshire or, or York or the Shambles or something. Uh, and they about it all goes well for um about 30 years and then they realize that they basically can't compete with the dutch the dutch have got better ships better captains uh they are uh, uh got more much more sophisticated financial instruments and by about 1640 the east india company comes into con uh, comes into conflict with the dutch and the dutch basically win and a deal is done the east india company and the brits hand over so I keep saying the Brits, the English at this point, hand over the um, Spice Islands of Indonesia. And uh, in a deal which turns out to be rather good in the long term, they get in return a muddy island in the Hudson River called Manhattan. Um, but at this point, they have to, in other words, sort of redesign their business model. And they decide they're going to forget spices and they're going to forget the East Indies. And they're going to focus primarily on textiles and on India. So it's around 1640 that the uh, that the what's originally called the London Company of Merchants trading with the East Indies turns into the East India Company trading with India and trading particularly in textiles. And this is a very good moment because uh, here they are. They've got their they uh, they build their their first uh, dockyard in Deptford. And all goes well until um, the Emperor Aurangzeb dies in 1707. And the Mughal Empire, which has been this huge force controlling most of modern India, all of modern Pakistan and Bangladesh and Afghanistan, and a slither of Persia. Um, uh, Aurangzeb overexpands the empire. The empire begins to collapse on his death. The Marathas erupt out of the Western Ghats. The, uh, Jats in the Doab uh, start raiding Agra. The Sikhs come down from the Punjab and get as far as the outskirts of Delhi. And everyone's wondering, you know, what's going to happen to Delhi? Delhi is the largest city on earth at this point. It's, um, uh, you have to go to Istanbul uh, on what, uh, to the west or to Edo, modern Tokyo, uh, to the east to find anything even remotely comparable. This is an enormous city with a wonderful Chandni Chowk in the middle. Uh, and everyone's wondering who it is that's going to get to pluck this ripe, rotting mango uh, full of all the wealth that the, that the Mughals have mined or traded or looted themselves in their conquests of India over the previous 150 years. And it turns out it's none of them. It's a wild card. It's this guy, Nader Shah, the Shah of Persia. And Nader Shah was born the son, humble son of a farrier or a shepherd who made hats. Uh, and he joins the Safavid Persian army, rises to the top and executes what we would call a military coup. And in 1738, he decides he needs some more cash to fight his real enemies who are not the, Mo the Mo Mongols, sorry, not the Mughals, but are the Russians and the Ottoman Turks. 
And he tells his doctor, who's a Frenchman, who keeps a very interesting diary, that he wants to pluck some golden feathers from the mogul peacock's tail. And that's what he does. He goes off and he raids Kabul, loots it, but no one comes to stop him. So he raids Peshawar at the bottom of the Khyber Pass and still no opposition show he takes Lahore. Each stage um, surprised by the ease of this. Uh, and then he decides to go and conquer Delhi. And finally, the Mughal emperor wakes up and pulls an enormous army together. But with the army are dancing girls and jugglers and uh, pastry chefs and uh, um, all the kind of Delhi society seems to turn up in Karnal in this enormous encampment, completely chaotic. And the Persians are these battle hardened, tightly run, small cavalry, but they have the great military gizmo of the day, which is something called the swivel gun which pierces armor. Uh, and the Mughal cavalry line up on the fields of Karnal and they start marching forward. It's a wonderful sight. They're all in that same elephant armor that um, uh, Aurangzeb is in here. Imagine um, 100,000 cavalry charging across the plains wearing this sort of thing. Uh, and um, the Persians pretend to be panicked by this and they retreat. And at the last minute, the light cavalry part revealing these swivel guns beyond. And it's all over in about five minutes. The, uh, the, the cream of the Mughal cavalry uh, are, are massacred. And that evening, Nadir Shah on the right invites Muhammad Shah Rangila on the left here in this picture to dinner. And the idiot, Muhammad Shah Ragila, goes with just a small bodyguard and accepts the hospitality of Nadir Shah. Uh, and of course, after dinner, his bodyguard is disarmed and he's told he's the guest of Nadir Shah. And the next day, Nadir Shah marches him into um, Delhi on his own elephant. Six weeks later, he leaves. With him, he brings 8,000 wagons of loot, everything the Mughals have gathered including the peacock throne on top of which is the, uh, on top of the top peacock of the peacock throne is the Kohinoor diamond. Um, uh, I, Andrew mentioned a blog, it's actually, a, it's a podcast. It's a podcast. And if you are, if you tune in to my podcast tomorrow, you will hear this exact story told in some detail. We are not currently doing the Kohinoor, it's called Empire. Uh, you get it on Apple or Spotify. Um, you'll hear the story in more detail if you haven't heard already enough tonight. Uh, but uh, the Kohinoor diamond, the peacock throne, three other Mughal thrones and 8,000 wagons of loot are carted off to Afghanistan. And it's as if the fires which have fired the Mughal boiler are extinguished because there's no money to run it, nothing to pay for all of this. And imagine you take Mughal, imagine the Mughal empire is some enormous Baroque mirror and you go up to the top of this building, you throw it off and it shatters into a thousand pieces. This is what happens to the Mughal empire. There's no money to pay the army, no money to pay the governors or the civil servants. And the whole thing shatters and fragments. And every city, Jodhpur, Jaipur, Hyderabad, Tanjore, becomes a, effectively a, 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 a self-governing state. And the powers which mop these up as the 18th century progresses are the two East India companies, the English East India Company and the Compagnie des Andes of Paris. And these are the troops doing the fighting. It looks a bit like a sort of uh, pride parade, uh, these outfits, that uh, it is in fact uh, the cutting edge mil latest military gizmo uh, of its day. Uh, these are the Madras sepoys. They are using technology developed originally by Frederick the Great of Prussia. There's a great military revolution in the 18th century involving bayonets and muskets and field artillery and 18th century ideas of ballistics. And these small infantry armies, very well drilled uh, in the Prussian style, are imported to India and can defeat massive Mughal cavalry armies. And they do from the 1740s onwards. And for about 40 or 50 years, 40 years, there is no effective Indian response. And these tightly trained sepoy regiments of locally recruited Indian soldiers fighting under uh, a few 
uh, imported European officers, only five or six percent European officers uh, in an overwhelmingly uh, Indian staffed army conquer one by one the different uh, uh, split fragmented provinces of what had been once the great Mughal Empire. And the big moment comes in 1756 when this man, Siraj Dowla, this incidentally is a, is a painting recently given to uh, the Chamber Street Museum in Edinburgh uh, by the Swinton family. Remember I pointed out uh, Archibald Swinton on that painting. This is from his collection. Now it shows Siraj Dowla, the governor of Bengal. And Siraj Dowla was understandably irritated because the East India Company in Calcutta had started rebuilding their defenses. Uh, he thought this was to keep him out. Uh, in fact, it was because uh, a, a, a faulty intelligence, the same thing which had caused the uh, Iraq war in our time, uh, misunderstood intelligence, also resulted in the Seven Year War. Uh, in, and the East India Company receives a faulty piece of intelligence that the French are sailing with an enormous flotilla from their port uh, in Port Lorient, um, south of Brittany, uh, and that they're heading to Bengal. And so the East India Company uh, puts together an enormous flotilla under this man, the young Robert Clive. And he sails across the world and arrives in Bengal to find that there is no French flotilla, that he's completely wasted his time. Um, and uh, in fact, the flotilla had sailed off to Canada at the beginning of what uh, all that Daniel Day Lewis stuff in uh, you know jumping over waterfalls and Lake Huron and uh, the, what the, the Americans call the French and Indian Wars. But his face is saved by Siraj Dal, who, irritated by the the rebuild the rebuilding of the fortifications of Calcutta, takes Calcutta and puts many of the officers, including my forebest, uh, Dalrymple, into the what is known to future generations of, of uh, schoolboys as the Black Hole of Calcutta, uh, a much mythologized event, which was much exaggerated by propagandists, but which did happen. And lots of young men and women died that night. And this is used as an as a excuse to send uh, Clive up to, um, sorry, Clive up to Calcutta. He retakes it in 1756. And then crucially, he gets a letter from a man called the Jagat Set. And the Jagat Set is, means the banker of the world. And he is the kind of, you know, the, the Indian Mawari equivalent of the Rothschilds. As India in the 18th century degenerated into, into very regional anarchy, the Jagat sets to find a way to send the Mughal tax revenue from Bengal to Delhi, thousands of miles, by a credit system. In the old days, you just load up a whole load of carts full of gold coins in chests and march it with the regiment of soldiers up the Ganges as far as Delhi. Now the Jagat sets use these credit notes and you feed it into their office in Rashidabad and you can withdraw it in their office in Delhi. And they take 10% along the way. As a result of which, um, according to one chronicler, wealth flows into the Jagat sets coffers like the Ganges flows into the sea. So the, the, the Jagat sets become this enormous, uh, incredibly rich credit organization. And they are irritated with Siraj Dowla, who's attacked the East India Company, who are good clients. So they basically reach out to Clive after he's retaken Calcutta and says, come up one stage further, come and um, do what I suppose we would call regime change today. Get rid of Siraj Dowla uh, and uh, I will give you personally one million pounds and I will give the East India Company a further million pounds. And Clive said, yep, no problem at all. I'm on my way. Uh, and so what we today regard, uh, what has always been taught traditionally is this great uh, uh, heroic victory of Clive, the Battle of Plassey with Clive charging ahead on his charger, uh, and uh, in fact is a big fiddle. Uh, not only is Clive in the pay of the Jagat sets, but so is Siraj Dowla's leading general, Mir Jaffa, who helpfully walks off the field halfway through with half the army. Uh, and uh, Siraj Dowla flees, uh, knowing that there's treachery, leaving his palaquin, which we saw in the first slide, uh, 
uh, now sitting in Paris Castle on the battlefield. He's captured, murdered, paraded through Mashidabad, and the next day Clive walks in and just stuffs his pockets with the jewels and the gold. And when many years later he's finally pulled before Parliament and asked why, when he was sent off to fight the French, uh, he felt that he could just uh, A, fight Siraj Adala, and then B, help himself to his treasury. He said, my lords, uh, in a rather sort of Boris Johnson -y moment, uh, he said, my lords, uh, I, uh, I, a prostrate city was, was uh, uh, waiting on my convenience. The bankers were begging for my favors. My lords, I was astonished at my own moderation. Uh, and, and, ra <laughs> and rather as with party gate, so, you know, all the Tories fall about laughing uh, and he gets off uh, and he's let off. Uh, and nonetheless, this transaction instantly makes him the richest self-made man in Europe because these are vast sums of money, vast sums of money, sums unheard of in Europe at this time. Uh, Lady Clive, a year later, comes home uh, and her pet ferret has a necklace worth 5,000 pounds of jewel of, of diamonds from the Murshidabad treasury. Uh, and so, you know, hugely different scales of wealth that had ever been seen in these islands starts hemorrhaging its way towards Britain. Seven, eight years later, the Battle of Buxa, 1765, uh, the puppet put on the throne by, uh, by the East India Company, Mir Qasim, by this stage, uh, joins up with the Nawab of, uh, of kind of central Ganges, uh, Avad, Lucknow, Shuja Daula, and the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam, seen in this picture. And all three are narrowly um, uh, defeated by Hector Munro uh, of, of this parish. Uh, and uh, Hector Munro, uh, in, the, in the victory of Buxa, manages effectively to uh, defeat all the Mughal armies in North India, leaving the entire northern half of the Mughal Empire entirely now prostrate at the East India Company's feet. And that's when this Diwani document is signed and the East India Company takes control of the finances of Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa. It's rather like, you know how the government can now hand over prisons to, what's that company called, 4GS or whatever it is, you know, privatizing a security thing. It's as if the entire state is taken over by Amazon, which may yet happen with Quasi Quartang in the charge, but it hasn't quite happened yet. Uh, and it's that kind of thing, a private corporation for profit takes over the entire workings of the state in the richest bit of the world. The equivalent today would be Amazon taking over the Bay Area, taking over Hewlett Packard and Amazon and Apple and all these other enormous rich Bay Area companies. Because at this point, Bengal is home to one million looms, making the best quality cotton in the world, the most profitable pre-industrial area on the globe. And the East India Company just gobbles it up. And they spend the money increasing the size of their army. So you go from 6,000 sepoys at the Battle of Plassey to uh, 30,000 by the 1780s to by 1799, the East India Company army has 200,000 Indian mercenary sepoys, which is exactly double in 1799, the size of the entire British army. So a corporation still operating from that tiny building in Leadenhall Street has an army twice the size of the British army at the moment when the British army is just about to rearm and fight, and fight Napoleon. So it's, it's corporate power on a scale unparalleled. Not only does it have the economic means to bribe, dine, lobby, and win over most of parliament already, and by this stage, two thirds of the MPs in parliament have East India Company shares. But there's also, because by this stage, by the 1780s, enough of these rich young men who've, who've made their fortunes in the East India Company have come home and bought rotten boroughs that are MPs themselves. Uh, so they have their own effective, their own, I mean, not formally their own party, but effectively their own group in parliament that will vote uh, for the East India Company's interests. So not only does the company defeat its enemies abroad, 
At home, it's busy corrupting parliament at home and inventing the ways that still survive by which corporations influence democratic institutions. In the meantime, however, the East India Company business model is changing. We've seen how it moved from trading in spices in the East Indies to trading in textiles in India. Now it has a different thing uh, because in the old days, you used to have to send gold out from London to buy all this stuff. If you wanted to buy cotton and silk and, and nice embroideries, you had to fill a ship with gold and, and, and buy things in India. But now you've conquered North India. All you have to do is tax the Indians. And then you, with the profits of that, you buy your silk and your cotton and, uh, or, and the saltpeter and all the other things you want to trade in Europe. So it's a fantastic business model. You don't have to bring any money out, but you come home full of, of, of all the goodies. No wonder these huge country houses uh, are being built all over Scotland by this stage. But then they realize again, there's something else they can do. On the edge of the land where previously there's uh, they, all the agricultural land is already being in, employed with paddy fields and so on. On the marginal land, you can grow opium. So they then develop a new business model whereby they grow opium in vast quantities in India, becoming in the process the largest narco operators in history, making the Medellin cartel look like child's play. Uh, Pablo Escobar is like Andy Pandy compared to uh, uh, these guys. They then conquer great chunks of, uh, of the coast of China and take seize Hong Kong. Uh, as they're uh, operated with lots of Scots like the Jardines and the Mathesons uh, piling in at this stage. Uh, and um, they have a fantastic second business. So they, they grow opium very cheaply in India. They sell it very expensively in China, illegally, fighting wars to, for, to, for the right of what they call free trade, something that the Americans are less keen, obviously, now to offer Pablo Escobar. You never hear about the... Uh, 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 the drug department uh, uh, singing, talking about the joys of free trade when it comes to cocaine. Uh, and they buy with the proceeds of that Chinese tea, which they then sell in India, in London and in America. And it's East India Company tea, of course, which is dumped in Boston Harbor at the American, uh, at the Boston Tea Party, because the when the East India Company goes bust following the Bengal famine of 1770, part of its recovery process, the company allows it to sell its tea in America. And this is what the early patriots are worried that the East India Company is gonna be let loose on them. So by now, this sort of creaky Tudor startup with a bunch of pirates, operating out of a, a couple of ships and a, and, and a kind of pub in London, uh, is now very clearly got the lineaments of the first great multinational, the same sort of thing that Amazon or Google or Microsoft is today. Uh, the East India Company flag becomes partly probably the model for the American flag. And this is now what the headquarters of the East India Company looks like. It looks like Buckingham Palace. Um, <laughs> It occupies the whole of Leadenhall Street uh, because its interests now encompass the entire globe. The director's uh, boardroom is where, from uh, the place from where the entire interests of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh and Afghanistan are, in modern terms, uh, are controlled. They have these vast docks, the East India Company docks. This is taken as if from what is now Canary Wharf, looking out down to Greenwich. And those are the East India Company docks. It's still the name of the tube station uh, from which the East India Company unloads all its opium, cotton, silks, saltpeter into warehouses. Uh, and it also has a second establishment at Brunswick where it's building uh, 30 or 40 clippers a month to take all its goods around the world. So it's a completely different scale to, the, to what we'd seen uh, at the beginning. It's now the first multinational with tentacles in every, uh, uh, in every uh, country, but also as Andrew's work has shown, um, uh, five minutes, uh, as Andrew's work has shown, enriching every parish in Scotland uh, with nice Palladian houses coming up in, in county after county, um, thanks to, uh, thanks to the, the, the proceeds of many, many Scots East India Company employees. It all goes on uh, 
becoming more, by 1770, there's this terrible moment, there's a famine in Bengal, the East India Company doesn't put out a single soup kitchen, nor has it prepared like all sensible Indian rulers do, um, stores of grain for, for lean years. So five, maybe five, uh, the figures are disputed, three to five million possibly, some people say seven million, but anyway, let's say five million Bengalis starved to death. The East India Company does not blanch at this uh, and sends its sepoys out into the field to gather the taxes anyway. And they erect gibbets and anyone, even if they're starving, who doesn't pay is hung. When the shareholders at the annual general meeting in London hear that the full taxes have been gathered, they vote themselves an increased dividend from 10 to 12 and a half percent. But this is not sustainable because they're effectively throttling the, uh, the goose that lays the golden egg. So two years later, the company begins to go bust. And the first bank to go bust is round here. It's the Air Bank. AYL, uh, and 30 other banks collapse uh, when it's become apparent that the East India Company is about to go bankrupt. The Bank of England, who hasn't had its finest day over the last couple of days, uh, tries to intervene. And as with today with Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss, uh, they find that they're overwhelmed by the scale of the chaos uh, and they can't bail them, bail them out either. So they have to go to Parliament. And eventually in 1784, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, an act is passed in Parliament whereby, rather like bailing out Nat West after the subprime collapses 10 years or 15 years ago, um, the, uh, the East India Company is effectively part nationalized and, and, the, and the government takes a 50% share. So what had been a libertarian free range, free market, um, sort of libertarian dream of a completely unregulated company uh, doing whatever it wants over a great chunk of the globe, now becomes more like a public-private partnership. And over the course of the 19th century, the government begins to seize more and more of it and control more and more of it. First of all, um, uh, individual uh, operators are allowed to uh, break its monopoly. So you get Jardine Matheson's and other Scots companies coming and setting up their own uh, businesses in India and in Hong Kong. And finally, in 1857, there is a huge rebellion, the largest anti-colonial revolt to take place anywhere in the world at any point in the 19th century. Uh, and it's not one of the Indian princes or the Marathas who rise up, it is this, the sepoys of the company, it is their own security services. And they are put out because the company has had a sudden wave of evangelical fervor and many of the officers are talking about uh, reading the bible to the the brahmins on parade and putting up the ten commandments outside the collector's house and all this sort of thing and so when the the enfield uh, rifle is issued um, and these new cartridges are given which have pig fat and cow fat many people believe probably wrongly but it is nonetheless it is believed uh, that the company is about to convert them to Christianity. Uh, and they all rise up and there's a massive rebellion and the company nearly collapses and the, uh, uh, the uh, hold of the company and of Britain on India is nearly unstuck in 1857. But in the end, it's sheer financial muscle and organization wins out. And they're able to basically recruit a whole new army from the Punjab and Waziristan and the, the same sort of people that uh, the Americans are drone bombing in, 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 the, in uh, Waziristan and the tribal territories of Pakistan were recruited. And they, uh, the Pashtuns are always happy to come and loot Delhi, and they did. Uh, and in the, on the 28th of September, 1857, they burst into the Kashmiri gate, which is the scene you see here. And they begin then to lock the gates and burn it every male over the age of 16. Uh, they then round up uh, for months afterwards, anyone who's in any way implicated in this uprising. Probably the most brutal moment of the entire British empire, maybe hundreds of thousands, there are no exact figures, but the nastiest and worst, uh, 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 war criminal, as we must call him in modern parlance, is Colin Campbell, who still sits on, a ho on his horse, or is he on his, is he on a horse, or Colin Campbell? He's, he's standing, where is he? George Square. George Square. Still his statue is there. 
he sewed up men in pigskins and blew them from the mouths of cannon and then made them lick up the, 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 the blood of the, the massacred women in the Bibigar and all this sort of horror. Uh, it is a very, very gruesome moment. The nastiest uh, war crimes, I think probably certainly in my area of study ever committed by the British in India. But at the end of it, not only is the company rolled up, but the Mughal Empire as well. And instead it's nationalized and turned into the Raj. And this is the punch cartoon marking this moment. Um, just as the company had blown these sepoys and Colin Campbell particularly enthusiastically had blown these sepoys from the mouths of cannon so that their entrails sort of scatter off. It's a horrific way of dying and a particularly nasty sight, but it was deliberately put on as a spectacle. And this is how Punch imagines it with the East India Company headquarters being blown from the mouth of the cannon. And as the all the count books and the scrolls burst out of their library, nepotism, blundering, avarice, misgovernment uh, is, is, is the comment of Punch. But effectively, the East India Company is rolled up, as the Times says at the time, with less bother than a re regional railway bankruptcy. And it becomes the Raj. But the interesting thing is that the Raj which is how we tend to think of the British in India. We talk about the British Raj as if that's all that was. It's only 90 years long, 1857 to 1947, 90 years. But the East India Company is knocking around from 1600, the time of Shakespeare, until 1857, which is 250 years. So it's bad enough being colonized at all, but it's much more sinister to be colonized by a multinational corporation that only exists for profit. And it makes it a particularly stark story because there's no, the East India Company, whatever it was, well, it was not hypocritical. It didn't pretend to be about a civilizing mission or uh, uh, building ports and, uh, and, and uh, museums and libraries across India. It was about making a profit. It was about the share price. It was about the annual general meeting and rewarding the shareholders and the directors. And they did that very effectively. And they enormously increased the wealth of, of Great Britain, Britain and England and Scotland and Northern Ireland and Ireland and Wales in the process, immeasurably richer as a result of this. Um, but it's not a pretty tale when you look at it in detail. I'll just end with, this is the, the one moment that the, the parliament gets its act together and begins to try and look into what's going on is the, um, uh, the impeachment of Warren Hastings, but they get the wrong guy effectively because Warren Hastings is actually one of the more decent East India Company men who had an interest in Sanskrit culture, founds the Royal Asiatic Society, learns Bengali and Hindi and is, is uh, uh, certainly a much uh, more uh, attractive character than Clive, who's just a brute. Um, but when he, it's worth just recalling to end the words of the Lord Chancellor as he stands with his gavel, here we are, at the, uh, uh, at the trial of uh, uh, Warren Hastings, he stands up and he says, corporations have neither bodies to be punished nor souls to be condemned. They therefore do as they like. Thank you very much. Life-affirming lecture, I, I think we would call that. The phrase too big to fail <laughs> has just been has just been historicized in some way. But you can obviously sense both the scale um, and I think some of the human character that comes out um, of this, both in terms of the the British um, or corporate colonial elite, as well as um, many of the nameless souls in South Asia that will suffer from that corporate model. Um, we have um, probably about at least 20, 25 minutes for questions. I'm conscious that we have colleagues joining us online. So whoever is keeping an eye out for the online questions, put your hand up if there are any. In the interim, I'm, um, William has made it more than clear he's welcoming questions from the floor. So please um, put your hand up. There are roving mics, I believe. Thank you again for our, our, our wonderful wide ranging yet in many ways, very sobering uh, um, uh, survey of the company and its checkers. Can, can I actually, before you ask the question, can we just ask you um, your just two minutes on what it meant for Scotland, the East India Company, and what the examples 
what the examples, the, the most obvious examples, tickling Glasgow I I could dig out of, my notes. <laughs> of, of East India Company loot that people will pass every day in the cup in them. All right, cool. Um, what does it mean for Scotland? Um, well, you've seen the scale of it. Um, we tend to associate this city with the um, terrible trade in slavery. And it is, it's a city that's been embedded in slavery. But at the same time, Scotland is heavily involved disproportionately in that organization. And maybe the best way to put it is, if we think of Lanarkshire in the 1770s, East Indiamen are bringing back money that's equivalent for just Lanarkshire of 20 extra banks. Uh, in other words, Scotland moves from being a relatively poor, in fact, in European terms, very poor country, to being with England and the Dutch Republic, the third richest society in the world. Now, that doesn't mean we aren't still poor, we don't have our, but Scotland's liquidity, its great economic liftoff, is disproportionately probably more than England, in fact, reliant on the mass enslavement of Africans and their descendants, and the image we've just seen of what British corporate power does in India. So when Scotland and its society choose to think that we have a history which is that of being on the receiving end of British imperialism, which to some extent the society was, we need to be a bit more humble and a bit more grounded and remember that we are hugely complicit in the worst aspects of British colonialism. Um, Glasgow and, has both of those eastern and western aspects, and that's all I would say because well, one, one last thing, big, big country houses big in the area. Houses. What, who, oh, which are the big ones around about here? Take your pick. There's, there's probably 30 or 40 in the West Indian and East Indian houses within 30 miles of here, um, um, easily, or at least they were until they were demolished in the post 45 slump in landed power. Um, but, I, but I'm not here. Um, I, I'm now feeling I've been gazetted. Questions, questions, questions for, yeah. for, for William, please, because he has so many interesting aspects. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. Questions, please. Yes, please, sir. Wait, yeah, do you wait for the mic, please? Nowadays, we hear more about setting rights, the slavery, etc. Why is it what was the wrongs done to India is not raised at all? I mean, I think that's changing. Uh, I think that is changing. Slavery is a huge part of the story too. But uh, no, I think, uh, I mean, it's, the thing is, it's not on the curriculum. The terrible thing about the curriculum is that we get the impression from it that, that Brits are always on the right side. So we go from Henry VIII and his wives to Florence Nightingale to the emancipation of the slaves. So we, you know, we, we're not responsible for the slave trade, but our kids are taught that we're responsible for the emancipation of it. And then we defeat the Nazis and liberate the world and, and, and bring freedom to the world. And the fact that we conquered so many countries that every six days there's a celebration somewhere in the world of independence from this country. <laughs> it's the most celebrated festival internationally. <laughs> and it's just not part of the curriculum. We learn, you know, our kids learn about hypercourse systems and the Roman Empire. We learn about the Spanish Empire. We never learn about our own. It's a bizarre, bizarre situation. But you're right, it, it isn't known and it needs to be better known. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take some people up the back, but um, either move you right at the back, and then I get you, sir, and then we'll move down. Two gentlemen or individuals who are sitting online for any questions also raise their hand and let me know, and I will we'll take some questions from our, our virtual uh, audience as well. So, right up at the back, please, thank you. I'll be first. <laughs> Hello, I have a question online from Ronald. You made a rather loose reference to slavery. Was slavery any part of the East India Company's operations? Uh, not much. The, the, I mean, the main slave organ is, 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 is the Royal Africa country, uh, Company uh, and, then, and then all these other different slaving organizations. The East India Company was not so much involved. It wasn't completely free of it, but it was, was not so much a a slaving organization, but uh, it had many other ways of oppressing and uh, and enriching itself at the cost of uh, of those it governed and conquered. Uh, if we could 
come down and get you through with a couple of uh, hands up uh, midway down, and I'll take you through that. I'll get you in a moment. Okay, thank you. Um, anarchy, it seems to me, is a very appropriate title for the age in which we live, at least financial anarchy. <laughs> and it's that which particularly interests me in terms of the East India Company. As early as the 1690s or uh, um, early 17th century, um, the East India Company with its monopoly was really like even more important than BP on the FTSE today. It was really, really powerful. And yet it took a very elusive influence over the British economy. And two, just two things, if I can very quickly say, the Dadarian scheme started out actually as London investors who wanted a competitor to the EIC Correct. and the Scots getting together. And it was Will King William who blocked the IPO. They only went to Darien as a dud idea that they sold themselves in Edinburgh. However, when you then come to the early 18th, uh, 18th century, uh, a Tory government was persuaded by a bunch of rascals, their friends, um, to set up the South Sea Company, which again was a template from the East India Company to get the slave trade from the Span Span Spaniards after uh, the Treaty of Re Utrecht. They didn't know anything about slavery and they didn't know anything about South America. What they intended to do was, was uh, um, to privatize the national debt. Now, I'm, look, I'm sorry, I wanted, could, could you, could you, could you uh, just ask a question? question is, what was the influence of the East India Company on all these operations and how did they react to them? I think many of them were, I mean, what you, the impression you get in the, in the early days is that there is a small merchant elite based in London, which often have their, their fingers in several pies. So the guys who found the East India Company also have influence in the, invest in the Levant Company, in the Muscovy Company, uh, and in the Royal Africa Company. So often you have the same group of investors giving money in different, in, in different pots uh, in, in all these different worlds. Because it's a very small world. This, the, the 16th century London uh, is a tiny place. Uh, and the number of, of super rich people with money to invest is, is relatively small. Uh, so they're all interlinked by these merchant elites. And what we forget is that so much of this early Tudor and Elizabethan colonialism is corporate. So you get things like the um, Virginia Company, which, which colonizes great chunks of, of Virginia, and the Rhode Island Company. Uh, and then one of them still exists, the Hudson Bay Company. Uh, and it's all the same group of investors investing in all of them. So they're often interrelated. There's the squabbles and there's rivalries and, uh, and some of the most vicious corporate battles ever. Um, one of the amazing things about Clive is that he not only shows this sort of astonishing quality of winning on a battlefield by breaking the rules, coming in the rear, fighting at night, attacking during thunderstorms, in fog in the early morning, but he has the same capacity in boardroom fights and he takes on his great rival Sutherland and defeats him and then he does it again in parliament. So it, it's a small group um, with, with, with interacting with each other, sharing the same clubs, uh, going to the same schools and parties and uh, <laughs> and nothing's changed. <laughs> Doing lockdown together. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to ask a, a question about um, uh, another great kind of imperial name that came from India at that time. That was Rudyard Kipling and his uh, colonial connections. And he was, seemed to be very much embedded in that Indian culture and what was happening. But there's no mention of Rudyard Kipling. So Rudyard Kipling obviously is, is, is the, the bard of, of the high Victorian Raj rather than the East India Company. He, he's around in the, um, from the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Still an extraordinary writer. One of the great things to read on, on Rudyard Kipling is, uh, is Said. Uh, Edward Said writes an extraordinary essay on Kim. He rather likes Kim. Um, and he is both 
as, I mean, so this is the complication of this thing. You know, Kipling can be a very attractive writer, and Baba Black Sheep, the story of him being sent back to uh, to England and being bullied as a child, is an extraordinary short story. And there are stories like On the On the City Wall and Kim, which are very sympathetic books. But he is also the the the, the great drum beater for empire, imperialism, the Boer War, and the First World War. Um, so he's a he's a complicated character, but it's a different story. It's the story of, uh, in a sense, the, it's very very important to draw a distinction between the East India Company, which ends in 1857, and the High Raj, which is a slightly different story, um, no better in many ways, but um, but different. Um, I think the People up the back, but you're still doing the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you think that Adolf Hitler and Joe Stalin were any different from the East India Company? Because Hitler started out building Volkswagens by selling them on tick to Germans to fund his army. And he did the same with Audi, and he did the same with a BMW, who built the Messerschmitts. And even after the war, we still now buy Volkswagens, BMWs, and we don't buy Messerschmitts. Well, I think both Stalin, both Stalin and Hitler are, are on record for admiring the British Raj for its ability to control large areas and large numbers of people with minimum cost uh, and for the efficiency with which in a sense they subjugated people um, which is a rather chilling uh, warning I mean I think you know you've got to look at all these things individually uh, and different periods of history have different issues uh, they are different and they're and you know one could go to a million ways in which they're different but they're not different enough and they're not as different as we've led been persuaded ourselves and the big difference is because we won the war and the Germans lost it, they had to do all the soul searching about the darkness of their past. And we never have. We just haven't. Uh, and, and in a sense, it's now that this moment is, is, is coming, I think, and gradually the penny's dropping that, uh, but there's huge resistance. And so, you know, when one group of scholars raise all these issues, um, Liz Trust talks about us doing Britain down. I was on stage earlier in the summer with David Oleshuga, the uh, the wonderful historian of slavery, and he uh, we did a signing afterwards in a bookshop, uh, and there was this burly chap who'd been walking with us, and he he hadn't introduced him, uh, himself to me, I, and he was obviously with David, and I said, "Oh, are you a friend of David?" He said, "I'm his bodyguard," uh, because he now gets death threats from English nationalists who don't like him talking about slavery. So it's, uh, it's, I mean, I did get this because I'm white. Um, but uh, I know Satnam Sangera gets post bags full of insults and, and stuff. So it's touchy. Certain public scholars from, from American minority backgrounds put up. Get a lot more. That yeah. dialogue yeah. Um, could, could I ask you to get a gentleman there? And I spotted you off the back so yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Clive was clearly uh, a very successful and popular member of the club. How was it that he ended up in front of a, a committee in, in Parliament? Well, one of the nice things studying this history is, 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 the, is what the realization that Clive wasn't at all popular, uh, nor was the East India Company at all popular. Uh, people regarded the East India Company rather like people today regard hedge fund managers. Uh, with a mixture of, of sort of dislike and envy and uh, uh, and sort of hatred <laughs> uh, and and the sensation that they're making sort of dishonest money somehow or, or merchant bankers in the 1980s crashing their portraits into restaurants and all that stuff they were regarded as brutal nouveau riche from the first time you, uh, from the uh, the bengal famine in 1772 you get large numbers of whistleblowers producing reports of millions of starving Indians. And the image that the East India Company is making its money over the rotting corpses of people 
begins to proliferate and you get plays at the Haymarket where Clive is uh, satirized as Lord Vulture. Uh, and lots of stuff in local papers across the country talking about the brutes of the East India Company. Horace Walpole writing uh, angrily in his diary about the, we have outdone the Aztec, we the Spanish with the Aztecs and the Incas, our brutalities are even worse. Uh, with the, with the uh, and it's worse, he says, because they at least had the excuse of religion, we have only profit. Um, so there is lots of resistance to this. Uh, across the country. And Clive is so unpopular that, that he, after he's let off by parliament, he's booed and hissed as he goes through the streets of London. And ultimately he cuts his veins with a blunt paper knife and commits suicide and is buried in an unmarked grave. Don't you like the project? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. We'll get you next time. Yeah. Before I come to the main point of my question, I would ask a point of information. Uh, you have heard of the Battle of Assay. Do you pronounce it? People who are uh, intimately connected with the battle don't know how to pronounce it. Assay. Is it Assay, not Assay. Assay. I've actually been to the battle site with the current Duke of Wellington, and we walked around yeah, the, was his first battle. The, the, the site, and we picked up musket yeah. balls still on the, on the it ground. It was his first battle as a commanding general, and he called it uh, his greatest battle, the bloodiest one he ever saw for the numbers. Now, my uh, question is, it has a local connection. It's the proudest battle honor of the Highland Light Infantry. It was nearly wiped out, as I say. Um, but the, uh, my interest in the question is this. It's uh, it's known and reported at the time as a King's Regiment just by the name of the Colonel. Um, they never had numbers and they never certainly never had names as they had later in history. So my question is, what was the relation? Wellington was a British general in the British Army at the time. So my question is, what was the relationship between British generals and commanders from the East India Company and also between the King's regiments. Very good. And, and the uh, East India Company regiments. Very good question. And I described how the company starts off very much as a, a, a company and gradually becomes a public private partnership and ends up being nationalized completely. So there's a, a continually changing relationship with the British government. But from the beginning, you get as well as the East India Company's army, which is uh, full, of, which is has a tiny white officer elite and is overwhelmingly 90%, 95% Indian in its forces. You also get uh, British army regiments sent out. Uh, so in all these wars, there are, there are British army regiments, fewer at the beginning, more at the end. Uh, and by the, uh, from the moment that the British government gets highly involved from the Regulating Act in 1784, you get far more British army regiments arriving out. And it becomes such a situation such that by the time that the Duke of Wellington's elder brother, Lord Wellesley, is the governor general, what's happened is that the, in a sense, the government is using the East India Company as an arm of the British fight against the French. So Wellesley, who is not an East, uh, Warren Hastings, for example, is the first, the first governor general um, appointed under the Regulating Act, and he is an East India Company man. But two generations later, Richard Wellesley is brought in. He's a politician. He's been an MP, uh, and uh, he is sent out very much with a view to using the East India Company's army as an arm of the global struggle against the French. And he first of all disarms uh, a small French contingent in Hyderabad under Manco Raymond. Then he fights Tipu Sultan, who has French officers. Uh, and finally, he fights the Marathas, who also have French officers. And that Battle of Assay, which you referred to in 1803, is part of that fight. So you have, it's almost like you have a government cuckoo in a corporate nest. Wellesley sort of uses the East India Company as part of his, uh, his assault on, on the French interest in the eastern half of the globe. Uh, and the and Napoleon regards the company 
as easy meat. He says it's just a, a bunch of British shopkeepers. Uh, and he comes up with elaborate and sort of crazy schemes that he's going to march across Persia um, and join up with the Russians who are going to march over to Afghanistan. Uh, and then he's going to take, um, alternatively, he might take a boat down the Red Sea. And he, he does this. He takes Egypt. That whole business of Egypt was meant to be the first stage uh, of him then getting boats to the Red Sea and joining up with Tipu Sultan. Um, so it's, 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 I mean, there are wonderful parts of this. Tale. I tell this all in, in my second bit of the company quartet, the, the White Moguls. Um, sadly, we have run out of time. I was conscious of other questions, but, but we, 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 we've got other business to do. Um, uh, before I hand over um, to Pat uh, to undertake some society business, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, begin to thank William for that, to re through so many different landscapes of human <laughs> stories, of world changing events, of personalities and processes, which do have an eerie ring in terms of the contemporary resonance. And um, much of what we think of as modern Coptic power is actually many, many centuries old. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you for your time and effort. Could you join them and thank them again? <laughs> Okay, I now have the privilege on behalf of the society uh, to present, uh, this isn't your medal, this is, a, it, this is the chain of office of the president. Very great. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree it looks like it could have been looted by the Eastern <laughs> Company. Uh, uh, so that was a wonderful lecture of course uh, i couldn't help but thinking as you mentioned in the early days one of the heads of the east india company was sent to the tower of london for corruption i couldn't help but think that now we send such people to the house of lords <laughs> so uh on that happy note, William, uh, <laughs> let me uh, present with oh, to you thank the, you. I got a medal. the Society oh, uh, Minerva Medal, which is engraved uh, uh, with your thank name. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> and also, as is traditional, a paper with oh, thank you very much. Keep my society. Keep my um, papers in order. Thank you. Well, uh, like the generation game. Where's the cuddly toy? <laughs> well, there's no cuddly toy, but there are glasses of wine. Right. So please, uh, everybody, please join us in a glass of wine. Our next meeting is on the 12th of October, and that's given. Uh, this talk will be given by Gordon Dutton on what uh, the how the brain sees. You you see that uh, in the sheet. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. Do drink the wine, and thanks again. Finally, to.